When Jesus came to earth, he introduced a radical new kingdom that invites everyone to take part regardless of gender, race, or social status. He spoke the same way to everyone because he had just one assignment for everyone. Take up your cross, follow me, and do the same works that I did. The job of a woman in that kingdom looks exactly like the job of a man. The only role that anyone has in that kingdom is to be a follower of Jesus. How the Lord plays out that role in each of our lives depends on who that person is and not on their gender. Before returning to heaven, Jesus addressed a large group of women and men with the following instructions. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Jesus gave us no fine print, nor did he allude to any exceptions based on gender. Yet over the years, certain new doctrines have crept in and put limitations on what Jesus said that day and many other times throughout his ministry. Specifically, those doctrines restrict women from doing certain kinds of ministry, ministries that Jesus clearly mandated both genders to do. According to those new doctrines, women have spiritual and emotional weaknesses and shortcomings that apparently men don't have. Women aren't allowed to preach, not allowed to teach men, and they're even forbidden to speak to the group when gathering with other believers. According to those new doctrines, if a woman is married, she must follow her husband because he is her head rather than the Lord and following the Lord directly for herself. On top of that, a woman must wear head coverings to show her subordination to men. Are women believers more weak-willed, impressionable, and prone to gossip than believing men? Is there any validity to the idea that Jesus doesn't want women to preach? Should women really keep their mouths shut when they fellowship with other believers? Should women truly subordinate themselves to men, and must wives expect the Lord to lead them through their husbands? Does the Lord prohibit a woman from teaching a man? Jesus never talked about any of this stuff, and since he literally handed out the same marching orders to both women and men, where in the world do those new doctrines come from? I'll show you exactly where they come from. You're about to see how deliberate mistranslations of the original text have for centuries convinced Christians that Jesus somehow forgot to mention some extremely important information while he was here. Hidden rules pertaining to chain of command and literal gag orders forbidding women from teaching a man or preaching. Only one problem, Jesus commanded everyone, including women, to do everything those new doctrines forbid them from doing. Hi, I'm Dolly Weber. Let's take a look at some pretty nasty things going on in Jesus' day. We already knew that the world was full of prejudice, pride, and oppression for those living on the other side of the track, but how many of us knew that probably the largest group of despised and oppressed people was women? Women in Jesus' day and for centuries before that had lived a life of total seclusion, servitude, and even abuse. They generally received no education at all except how to cook and perform household duties. They were never allowed to go places by themselves, and if women did go anywhere at all, they went with other women as a group. Women seldom went anywhere even with their own husbands. They never attended social functions or outdoor sports, and definitely took no part in government. For a woman to speak in any group setting was scandalous and literally against the law. Going to the market was the man's domain. Women weren't even allowed there either. Women rarely ate their meals with men, not even with their own husbands. They fed their husbands and their children and then ate separately themselves. Men spoke very few words to women and typically married women without even meeting them. A woman's personality or intellect mattered little to a man deciding who to marry. Society taught women to be seen as little as possible, heard as little as possible, and to ask questions as little as possible. Not only does historical record bear this out, but we read vile statements made by highly influential men whose literal hatred towards women heavily influenced the Western world from long before Jesus right up through today. According to Plato, women are those who fell prey to their irrational emotional side and are therefore incapable of reason and making rational choices. Socrates stated, In all the species, is it not obvious that the male is far superior to the female? Aristotle said, The courage of a man is shown in his ability to command. 
the courage of a woman is found in obeying. The contorted thinking of these and other philosophers shaped a world that completely undermined any value at all to women except for their ability to do housework and make babies. Even the natural beauty of women was held against them and gave men an excuse to keep women in the background as stupid and nothing but temptation and trouble. Hebrew literature from the Talmud reflects the same attitude. As an old Hebrew prayer says, Praise be to God that he has not created me a Gentile, a woman, or a hog. In oral Jewish law, one statement reads, Even the most virtuous of women is a witch. Misogyny means hatred for women, and by taking even a quick journey through ancient history, we don't have to look very hard before we see how misogyny has saturated all of society, mitigating, muzzling, and restraining half of the adult population due to hateful stereotyping against women. This same hatred heavily shaped the Christian world as well, not only through so-called church fathers, but even through the very man who translated the Bible into Latin, arguably doing more harm against women than all other misogynists combined. Misogynist attitudes stand in blatant contrast to renowned women of faith like Deborah the Judge, Judith the Widow, who with her own sword killed an Assyrian general, thereby defeating the whole Assyrian army single-handedly. The persistent and self-sacrificing Hannah. The extremely courageous Esther, who risked her own life for the sake of a multitude of people. A young virgin who withstood heavy condemnation and severe trials due to the one who was divinely conceived in her womb. And one incredibly courageous mother who with her seven sons chose torture and death over sinning against God because they refused to eat pork. Misogynists never had any valid reason for their wicked views against women. From the very beginning, when the Lord created women, he made it clear that they would be equal in strength to men and in no way inferior to them. In Genesis, we read that God made a help meet for Adam. The Oxford English Dictionary says that help meet means even with or equal to. The original word for help meet was ezer, a combination of two root words, one meaning to rescue or save and the other meaning to be strong. If we combine the two meanings of that original word, we we find a far more accurate understanding of what the Lord presented to Adam when he created Eve, a saving partner equal in strength and power. Yes, Eve was far more than just a suitable helper or qualified assistant, as one might easily construe reading a less than perfect translation of Genesis. Years ahead of time, through the prophet Joel, the Lord told us that in the last days he would pour out his spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, Joel said, and his words were fulfilled at Pentecost and thereafter. By the time Jesus came, the entire world had embraced these vicious lies about women. So how did Jesus respond? He completely ignored their views, boldly broke all their rules, and preached a gospel that put women on the very same level as men. Jesus taught women. He spoke to women in public. He loved it when they asked him questions, and he gladly answered their questions. He chose a former prostitute to preach one of the most important messages ever preached on earth, Jesus has risen. He struck up conversation with a woman standing all by herself at a well, even though stigmas of the day inferred that she was a prostitute and that Jesus was soliciting her services. But Jesus never cared what society taught or thought about women, nor did he steer his actions according to how people might construe them. Jesus announced a new genderless, one-size-fits-all role for everyone in the kingdom of heaven. Sit at my feet, learn from me. Then go where I tell you to go. Whether you are a man or a woman, your assignment is the same. At the home of Mary and Martha, Martha busied herself with household chores which society wanted women to do. But Mary hung out with Jesus and listened to Jesus. Not only was Jesus happy to have Mary talk with him, but he literally shunned society's gender roles when he told Mary that what she had chosen was better than performing the chores her sister Martha was carrying out. Jesus says to his daughters today, choose what is better. I am offering you an entirely new role, the role of a disciple. The the same role I offer to men. No wonder so many men hated Jesus. Besides all that he had exposed about the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus also exposed the lies that for centuries had put women on a much lower plane than men. Jesus set women free to preach, to teach, to prophesy. Not only did Jesus say, I permit you to preach, but to women, Jesus said, I command you to preach. 
So if from the beginning to the end of his ministry, Jesus never once even hinted about rules or restrictions on women, where did all those gender-based rules come from? Meet the man certain New Testament translators wanted you to blame them on. Meet the Apostle Paul. Let me give you a few lesser-known facts about Paul. First, he traveled and ministered with a married couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Notice I say the wife's name first because four out of six times the couple's names appear in the original text, her name does come first. That meant Priscilla, not her husband, was the dominant one, the leader in their marriage and in their ministry. Typically, back then, the husband's name would come first. However, Priscilla came from the wealthy family of a Roman senator named Caius Marius Pudens Cornelianus, otherwise known as Cornelius, who had come to Jesus through Peter's ministry. Born into prominence and privilege, Priscilla was highly educated and also skilled in speaking and writing. Her husband, Aquila, on the other hand, was a Jew, most likely a freed Jewish slave. While Aquila as a slave may have had some education, he in no way received the education that Priscilla received, nor was he as gifted to preach and teach as Priscilla was. Paul's references to Priscilla and Aquila also denoted Priscilla as the dominant teacher. Priscilla and Aquila took under their wing a preacher named Apollos, who though passionate for the Lord, was not fully clear about the baptism and other new covenant issues. Priscilla, by Paul's own description, was the main person who taught Apollos. And yes, Apollos was a man. History shows that Priscilla, or Prisca, had wide influence on the Christians during the first century. In fact, a building called the Church of St. Prisca was built over the home of Priscilla and Aquila. Archaeologists have also unearthed the graves of Priscilla and her husband, found where else but the same family burial plot with Pudens Cornelius, the Roman governor. Priscilla was obviously a great woman of God who preached the gospel, who taught men and women, and had a passion to see new believers built up in the faith. It is also highly possible and even likely that Priscilla wrote the letter to Hebrews, as a growing number of men and women are finding highly plausible. Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul all lived in the house Priscilla owned, and the three of them ministered extensively together for several years. They also shared in the trade of tent making. Even people of great wealth in that day also had a trade and so Priscilla had her own trade, which she shared with her husband and also with Paul. Paul also tells us about other women gifted in preaching and teaching, such as Lois and Eunice, two godly women who taught Timothy. Women did a lot of teaching of men in the early church, and obviously Paul was perfectly fine with that fact. A second fact about Paul. He described beautiful family-style interaction that took place in the homes of the early believers when they met for fellowship. Everyone participated according to how the Holy Spirit led them. Paul never ever described those fellowship times as the men doing these kinds of things and the woman doing those kinds of things. In fact, Paul specifically acknowledged a woman of God named Phoebe, who was an overseer for the fellowship in Sincrea. Yes, a woman held spiritual leadership over men and Paul was fine with that too. In some cases, the fellowships were made up entirely of women and it goes without saying that all the women participated as the Holy Spirit led them. In all these things that Paul wrote about, never did he ever once allude to gender or any role that gender played as believers participated and contributed in their fellowship meetings or in spreading the gospel. A third fact about Paul. While fellowshipping with a group of men and women believers in Galatia, Paul said right then and there, you are all sons, brothers and sisters. In Jesus, there is no Greek or Jew. There is no slave or free. There is no male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So if we look at Paul's own ministry and the people he ministered with, we see absolutely no sign of gender distinctions or policies. If his own right-hand man was a woman who ministered powerfully by preaching and teaching, how could Paul have declared any new rules that would have so blatantly contradicted the way he walked out his own faith? Furthermore, if Paul ministered with a woman clearly directed by and anointed by the Lord for herself and not directed by her husband, then how in the world would our Bibles end up quoting Paul? Paul telling women to follow their husbands and not the Lord directly. Well, remember those wicked philosophers who propagated those lies about women? What if I were to tell you that some of them called themselves Christians and injected their misogynist ideas as theologians and even Bible translators? Let's start with Jerome, possibly the most influential of all those women-hating men. Jerome, who lived during the 5th century, is responsible for the Latin Vulgate version of the New Testament, which even Tyndale used in 
his translation. The Catholic Church today still considers that version the only official Bible, and in years past would order immediate death to anyone caught reading any other translation. So, what did Jerome believe about women? Nothing summarizes his feelings better than the following. Woman is the root of all evil. Woman is the gate of the devil, the road to iniquity, the sting of the scorpion. In a word, a dangerous species. Misogynist? You bet. Might his bias have possibly affected his translation whenever translating thoughts about women? You bet. How about Tertullian? He's one of those men so fondly referred to as a church father, and who also was the first person to use the word trinity when referring to a triune god. According to him, woman is a temple built over a sewer. It is contrary to the order of nature and of the law for women to speak in a gathering. And then he said, because of you we are punished by death. Because of you, women, the Son of God had to die. Origen lived in the second century and was best known for his massive Old Testament analysis written to answer Jewish and Gnostic critics of Christianity. Origen said the following, Men should not listen to a woman even if she says admirable things or if she says saintly things. They are of little consequence since they come from the mouth of a woman. And how about Thomas Aquinas? Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, is noted for his so-called Christian theology and how he skillfully integrated it with pagan philosophy. Aquinas said this about women, Woman is defective and misbegotten. It is natural that just as women have softer bodies than men, so too they have weaker reason. And then there's good old Martin Luther. A leader of the 16th century, Martin Luther was a reformer, someone we credit for his boldness in challenging the Catholic Church and its grossly unscriptural foundations. However, Luther himself held to some grossly unscriptural thinking, not the least of which pertain to women. According to him, the word and works of God is quite clear that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. There is no gown or garment that worse becomes a woman than when she would be wise. Men have broad and large chests and small narrow hips and more understanding than women who have but small and narrow breasts and broad hips to the end that they should remain at home, sit still, keep house, and bear and bring up children. One time Martin Luther was asked why girls mature more quickly than boys, and he answered, because weeds grow faster than roses. John Calvin? Ah, John Calvin. John stated, all women are born that they may acknowledge themselves as inferior to the male. The woman who had perversely exceeded her proper bounds is forced back to her own position. She had indeed previously been subject to her husband, but that was a liberal and gentle subjection. Now, however, she is cast into servitude. Calvin's wickedness did not stop with his perverse attitude towards women. He also believed in torturing and murdering those who opposed his views. Like Michael Servetus, who in 1553 Calvin burned at the stake, using a pile of green wood to make his death slow and more painful, all because the man rejected certain of Calvin's views about the Catholic Church. Then, 40 years later, in 1597, Calvin had a man named Jacques Gruet tortured for a month and finally beheaded because Gruet had placed a letter on Calvin's pulpit calling him a hypocrite. Calvin also had his own stepdaughter and son-in-law murdered for committing adultery. John Wesley, founder of the Wesleyan movement, said the following in a letter to his wife on July 15, 1774. Do not any longer contend for mastery, for power, money, or praise. Be content to be a private, insignificant person, known and loved by God and me. Of what importance is your character to mankind? If you were buried now, or if you had never lived, what loss would it be to the cause of God? And then, of course, we have King James I, the first speculative Freemason, Rosicrucian, and blatant homosexual, and also responsible for putting his own spin on the text in order to promote his ecclesiastical power. Good old King Jimmy said the following about women, to make women learned and to make a fox tame work out to the same end. Educating a woman or a fox simply makes them more cunning. If you don't think that Satan has used hateful, dishonest men to shape so-called Christian thinking, and even the very translation of the Bibles we've been using for centuries, then think again. Would you really trust a misogynist to convey what Paul believed about women? Can we really believe that Jerome and all those highly influential so-called church fathers did all they could do to truthfully present how Jesus feels about women and what he wants to accomplish for his kingdom by using women? 
Not if they could find a way to change and twist the original text, they wouldn't. And that is exactly what they did. First, they added words that weren't even in the original text. In Ephesians 5.22, we read a famous verse. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Some equate submission with obedience, which it is not. And Paul did encourage all believers to submit to one another by putting each other first, etc. But Paul himself never told women to submit to their husbands. Check your Bible and you will see that the word submit is in italics. That means submit was not in the original text. A misogynist named Jerome most likely put it there. The original text actually reads, Wives, be to your husbands as unto the Lord. It echoes the verse, Do all that you do as unto the Lord. The verse has nothing at all to do with subjection to a husband at all. Imagine how this corruption alone has taken untold scores of women down unspeakable paths of suffering and destruction, compelled to take their direction from husbands, even husbands that cared nothing about the Lord and cared nothing about them. But the corruptions do not stop there. Second, they like to change the words that Paul used in order to make it look like Paul agreed with the very beliefs that he was condemning. In Corinth, a diverse group of cultures began disputing over whether the women should wear something on their heads or not. As crazy as it may sound, and as crazy as it did sound to Paul, the various cultures in Corinth each had their own strict stigmas about head covering. When the believers of those different cultures came to fellowship, people were fighting over women's head covering, and the situation had gotten pretty bad. Italians wanted their women not to cover their heads. The Greeks wanted their women to cover their hair, but only if they were married. Orientals wanted all the women's heads covered all the time. The Jewish believers, while never having been given any instructions in the Old Testament and certainly never from Jesus, were still heavily influenced by the wicked Gnostic thinking of Jewish tradition, specifically from the Talmud and a book called Dat Moshe, or Torah Law. The laws promoted in those two Jewish books put heavy pressure on the Jewish women concerning their hair and head covering. According to man-made tradition, Jewish women had to cover their hair if they were married. Single women did not have to cover their hair unless they were at certain places or near certain men who were praying. Some of those laws were so extreme that a woman who exposed even one strand of her own hair in public was told she had sinned as badly as if she was publicly exposing private areas of her body. Corinth had become a total mess, all arguing over women's hair. So certain believers in Corinth sent a letter to Paul asking for help. The letter no doubt outlined what the various groups believed, and they may have gone into some of the thinking behind those beliefs. No doubt Paul, having been raised a Jew, already knew about those Jewish traditions and the wicked Gnostic thinking behind those traditions. So Paul responded with four clear statements in his reply, and believe it or not, he actually rebuked the Corinthians for making such a stink about hair covering. His bottom line was that women should decide for themselves what to put on their heads, and that where Paul was, which was probably where Priscilla and Aquila were also, there were no concerns about hair covering. However, Jerome did some rearrangement with the text and did his best to confuse Paul's response with the actual Gnostic thinking he was correcting. Therefore, Paul came out looking like he was promoting head covering and supported the Gnostic beliefs behind them when nothing could be further from the truth. What resulted was 2,000 years now of people thinking that Paul made up new rules that he himself never even made. All of this happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The passage begins by stating rules concerning the length of men and women's hair but they were not Paul's rules. Those ideas presented there had never been stated in scripture at all, but they did reflect the Gnostic thinking of the day. A woman is man's glory. A man is God's glory. A woman is from man, but man is not from woman, and so on. Paul responded to that gobbledygook theology and set things straight. Here are the four points that Paul makes. First, your theological reasoning isn't even valid, because neither gender is independent of the other but both come from the Lord. Notice in verse 11 and 12, he says, Yet in the Lord woman is dependent on man, and man is dependent on woman. As the woman was made from the man, so a man is born of a woman, and it all comes from God. Therefore, his second point was, let your women decide for themselves what to wear on their heads. You don't need to be deciding it for them. Where do we find this? In verse 10, the verse was translated to say, that's why a woman should wear a symbol of authority on her head 
head out of respect for the angels. The verse has three dead giveaway signs of tampering with Paul's intended response. First, the Lord never instructed his children in the Old Testament or by the words of Jesus to respect angels. That totally smacks of the Gnostic beliefs from the Talmud and other Jewish tradition that was steeped in angel worship and interacting with angels. Secondly, the words a symbol of were not in the original text. Jerome conveniently put them there. If you notice, you will see those words in italics. That is where the idea of doilies and handkerchiefs came into the picture, but certainly not from the mouth of Paul. And finally, the word translated as authority does not properly convey the word exousia that was actually used in that sentence. Exousia best translates as having the right, having the privilege, having the prerogative, or having the jurisdiction. So verse 10 should have read, that's why a woman should have the jurisdiction over her own head. Paul had just corrected their theology by saying that men and women both come from each other and all from God. Therefore, stop dictating to the women and let them decide for themselves if they want to put anything on their heads. Be sure that Paul never instituted any policy for women to wear cloths on their heads. Leave alone as a sign of submission to anyone but the Lord. Leave alone for the sake of the angels. Third, Paul further silences the entire head covering issue and chalks it all up to arrogance and contention. In verse 16, Paul states two things about the fight over head covering. First, Paul and his fellowship did not have any policies regarding head covering. And second, none of the other fellowship groups did either. Notice in verse 16, he says, but if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom and neither does anyone else. Paul said we have no such policies here. Yet notice another deliberate word change where Jerome snuck the word other in place of the word such. Other is in italics. And by switching the word to other, Jerome conveyed that the policies in question were just fine with Paul because Paul was saying we don't have any other policy to suggest to you. But that is not what Paul said. He said we have no such policies here. Then Paul adds that no one else is dealing with the crazy head covering issues either. Paul, in fact, had warned Timothy about the very kinds of Jewish traditions that were causing the fight over head covering and many other nonsense issues. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 to 5, Paul tells Timothy, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth. And finally, misogynists, whenever they could, like to change the names of women who had any importance and make it look like men did it instead. As we know, Paul referred to Priscilla and Aquila six different times in his letters, with four of those times strategically putting Priscilla's name before Aquila's. Yet in some translations, we find that name order was switched with Aquila's name before Priscilla's, obviously to undermine the importance importance of Priscilla as preacher and teacher and a woman who is led of God for herself. We also see blatant examples of masculinizing women's names to make it appear that they were men instead. Here's Nympha, the female, in Colossians 4.15. In the Revised Standard Version, it says, Give my greetings to the brethren at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And yet the name was changed to male in the King James Version. Greet the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphas and the church church which is in his house. Here's Junia, the female, in Romans 16, 7. In the King James Version, she is a woman. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen. But that name is changed to male. In this version, greet Adronicus and Junius, my kinsmen. And the last one, Eodia, the female, in Philippians 4, 2. In the New King James Version, reads, I implore Eodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. But Eodia becomes a male in the King James version, I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche that they be in the same mind in the Lord. Other nefarious name changes occurred at the hands of wicked so-called church fathers. Although Jerome himself had a disdain for women, two Roman educated women helped him translate the Bible from Greek into Latin. Their names were Paula and Eustochium, and Jerome did acknowledge the women by name after the project was finished. However, when so-called church fathers found out about the two women, they immediately erased their names 
names and gave credit to venerable brothers blatantly lying about who helped Jerome with the translation. Clearly, Paul and those he ministered with encountered many kinds of challenging situations with other believers, as mature believers do today. And the Lord gave Paul wisdom for those situations based on what Jesus taught. However, the Lord never sent anyone, including Paul, to announce new doctrine or new rules for all Christians to follow. Jesus left us with his law, two extremely demanding commands which he himself called laws. They cover every single detail of our life if we actually take them seriously. First, love the Lord with our whole life, our passions, our dreams, our reputation, our resources, and our relationships. And second, love people and treat people as though we were in their shoes, with a love willing to lay down our lives, our comforts, our schedule, our resources, and our conveniences for other people. If we obey the two laws of Jesus, then we can be sure that the Holy Spirit will guide us for every decision we have to make. If Paul knew that people were following him as a new lawgiver, he'd be appalled. Uh, yeah pun intended. And in fact, in that same letter to Corinth, Paul spoke of the fallacy he already saw at work in believers who followed other people, even good people, rather than following Jesus directly. In 1 Corinthians 1.12, he says, One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Each of us must follow Jesus to get his direct instructions for us personally and not through any other human being, whether we are a man or a woman. In the book of Acts, we read the story about a married couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Like other believers at the time, the couple sold one of their extra properties for the sake of sharing with the needs of other believers. However, before presenting the money to the apostles, Ananias decided to keep some of the money for himself, and he told his wife what he did. Ananias went to Peter and said that he had given them all the money he made from the sale of the property. But Peter perceived that it was a lie, and he rebuked Ananias for lying to the Holy Spirit. Immediately, Ananias was struck dead by the Lord for lying. A few hours later, Sapphira, the wife, not knowing what had happened to her husband, went to the apostles with the same lie. Peter rebuked her and said, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? The feet of the men who just buried your husband are at the door now to bury you. Then Sapphira fell down at his feet and died. Both the husband and the wife were responsible for their own actions. If the Lord had set things up for wives to follow their husbands, then Sapphira would not have died. After all, she was following her husband. But that's not how the Lord set things up for wives, not then and not now either. True brothers in the Lord, I strongly encourage you to look more carefully into this matter, lest someday the Lord holds you personally accountable for quenching the Holy Spirit in women simply because they were women. True sisters in the Lord, I urge you to do the same, lest the Lord hold you personally accountable for ignoring his voice because of deliberate translational errors implemented by men who flagrantly hated women. I recommend the following books for their valuable content, including historical facts and textual evidence that confirm not only what I presented in this video, but expose many more issues and the blatant evidence that proves serious tampering with the original text. God's Word to Women by Catherine Bushnell, The Christian Woman Set Free by Jean Edwards, and Priscilla's letter by Ruth Hoppen. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I look forward to talking to you next time. The Lord bless you.